the Bosphorus, meeting place of East and West, of two different cultures and religions. Most Islamic countries are still seen as economically and politically backward. Yet Turkey and the Gulf states above all are enjoying an ongoing economic boom. There has been much talk of Islamic finance, an economic concept with its roots in Sharia law. The concept of Islamic finance was developed in the 1980s. Since then, Volker Nienhaus has been studying the principles of Islamic economics, whose central tenet is a ban on interest and speculation. Could Islamic finance prove to be the much heralded third way between communism and capitalism? The traders in the Istanbul Bazaar offer a basic example of the meeting of commerce and Islam. Bizim dinimize göre kesinlikle faiz yemek haram. Allah'ın Allah Celle Celaluhu'nun emridir bu. Yani e, yardıma muhtaç kimselere veyahut da ticaret yapacak kimselere verin diyor. Nasıl verin? Karşılığında bir şey beklemeden verin. En küçük bir faiz dahi girse bütün kazancımız bozulur. Onun için biz kendi öz sermayemizi kullanıyoruz. Ha nasıl oluyor? Ya uzun vadede büyüyoruz. Hasan runs his drapery following Islamic practices and rulings that date back centuries. Ama aynı bu bu olmaz. Dieses Format. Bundan Das ist sehr glaubwürdig, dass hier ohne Kredit finanziert wird, ohne Kredit gearbeitet wird. Für die Volkswirtschaft insgesamt wäre das sicher ein Problem, weil äh, Industrialisierung, Wachstum, äh, um Arbeitsplätze und Einkommen zu schaffen, notwendig ist. Ich glaube, dieses ist ein interessantes Modell für einen persönlich, für einen überzeugten Muslim, der als Händler arbeitet. Heute in großen anonymen Gesellschaften, in internationalen Märkten kann man, glaube ich, dieses Modell nicht mehr verallgemeinern oder nicht mehr wieder aufleben lassen in der früheren Form. Das heißt, die Zeit, die Wirtschaft zur Zeit des Propheten ist doch eine deutlich andere, als sie heute ist. And yet, for Muslims, the rulings of the Prophet stand to this day. In London, the main center of Islamic finance in Europe, commercial law firms are developing modern products that comply with the rules of the Quran. Famida B, a Muslim herself, is an expert on Sharia compliant products. Sharia compliant product is a product which complies with Islamic principles um, on doing business and the one that everybody knows about is the prohibition against paying interest. Um, there are also other restrictions. You can't, um, for example, have a contract that's purely speculative. Um, so you can't have some of these derivatives products which are intended just um, for the purpose of creating a profit, and, and there's nothing underlying them. Um, there are restrictions on certain types of business, so a Sharia-compliant business can't trade in pornography or tobacco or alcohol or pork products. The United Kingdom was quick to recognize the significance of Islamic finance. The value of Islamic financial products has more than doubled in the last five years. Worldwide, the investment volume of Islamic finance stands at over a trillion Australian dollars, or 2% of the conventional market. The Islamist terrorist attacks in New York and London not only unsettled the West, but also led to a little noticed shift in the Islamic world. It saw a sudden return to traditional values, with economics in the vanguard. After 9-11, there was a huge amount of sympathy um, for the US, but um, we then did, had um, the, the Iraq war, and we had things like the Patriot Act. And I think the Islamic world felt 
um, that it was being blamed for the actions of a few criminals. And, and it also made people very conscious of what their religion was, what it meant. I think it made people go back and look at it. It made them become conscious of being Muslims. And I think that, in my opinion, that has very much contributed to the growth of Islamic finance. France has also been eager to win its share of this new market and to make Paris a center of Islamic finance. Paris economics professor Olivier Pastre advises the French government on these plans. La finance islamique a commencé dans les années 70, mais elle ne s'est développée que à partir du moment où les pays qui promouvaient la finance islamique sont devenus riches. Euh, et ont eu besoin de développer des financements. Euh, euh, c'est donc à, à partir du milieu des années 80 que la finance islamique s'est vraiment développée. Euh, encore une fois, le développement de la finance islamique suit à peu près le cours du pétrole. À ce moment-là, un certain nombre de, euh, de philosophes, de théoriciens euh, de l'islam ont dit euh, on ne peut pas... Euh, Euh, désobéir aux principes de l'islam euh, dans la vie financière. Encore une fois, la financiarisation de l'économie, c'est assez récent, hein, euh, euh, et en particulier dans les pays du sud de la Méditerranée et dans les pays du Golfe. The Emirate of Dubai began to plan years ago for the post-oil era. Despite suffering a property crisis, Dubai has outstripped all its neighbors to become the premier service and business center of the Persian Gulf. Peter Casey is an expert on finance and insurance. He came to Dubai from London in 2002. 85% of the people living in the United Arab Emirates are foreigners from a great variety of backgrounds. There are now more nationalities living in Dubai than in New York. Although Sharia law influences public life in many Arab countries, the economic boom in the Gulf was largely financed in the Western way. However, things are changing. In the states of the Gulf Cooperation Council, to which Dubai belongs, Islamic finance now has a 22% share of all investments. The Dubai International Finance Center is also the seat of the national regulatory body for Sharia-compliant financial products. Peter Casey is its director of policy and head of Islamic finance. I'm not a Muslim, I'm Christian. What that does do, do, though, is make it natural for me to believe that people who have a faith will, ex will expect to express it in the whole of their lives and not just in where and how they worship. The Muslim approach to Islamic finance, that it is a natural outworking of their, of their faith, is one that makes sense to me. If you were developing, say, a Christian ethical investment fund, and there are some, and you had to debate about whether you could invest in an in vitro fertilization clinic, some Christians would say yes, some would say no. If we, if we have that discussion a hundred years hence, that argument may well have played itself out. But even with, you know, within Christianity, we are coming to grips with some new possibilities of the modern world and we haven't got a consensus on it. Um, exactly the same things happen in the Muslim world. Bahrain is the seat of the accounting and auditing organization for Islamic financial institutions. Led until recently by Dr. Mohammed Nidal al Shaar, the organization draws up international standards for Islamic banking and finance. It emphasizes that one of the cornerstones of Islamic finance is the observance of ethical principles. I think ethics is a human uh, trait. And uh, if you decide to use ethics, that's a choice. So we opted to use ethics in our system. And those ethics stem from our Sharia law, which is the skeleton and the structure of Islam as a religion. And so you, you see in all of our transactions uh, real protection to the customer, to the investor, and after all to the society. 
because the purpose of transacting in a Sharia compliant way is to build planet Earth. That's your final objective. Dans la réalité, les fonds islamiques tels qu'ils existent aujourd'hui euh, sont assez souvent investis dans l'immobilier, dans le foncier, euh, dans les industries agroalimentaires, dans le tourisme, euh, relativement peu euh, dans, euh, dans l'industrie et relativement peu dans les services. Il y a sûrement, j'en connais pas, mais il y a sûrement euh, des fonds islamiques qui investissent dans l'économie verte, mais il n'y a pas particulièrement euh, de euh, recommandations dans ce domaine-là. Encore une fois, il faut bien distinguer la philosophie qui est très sp assez spécifique et la réalité, où en fait dans la réalité, on a à peu près les mêmes produits financiers, à peu près les mêmes types d'investissements que dans la finance euh, qu'on va appeler euh, conventionnelle. Critics claim that Islamic finance enforces Sharia prohibitions but neglects the type of principles that drive Western-style ethical funds. The social principles of the Quran are often ignored, for instance, in the treatment meted out to guest workers in the Gulf states. As in the boom days of Western Europe, hundreds of thousands of guest workers have been brought to the Gulf in order to build modern cities and industries. The vast majority of them are from the Indian subcontinent. Many are Muslims from Pakistan, India or Bangladesh, yet they are housed in camps well outside of the cities. Anyone who loses his job has three months to find another one. After that, he is deported. There are no trade unions and no welfare safety net. विदेश में कस को खुशी होने चाहिए कि विदेश में बस ने परिवार लाए छोड़ रहे है ना एग्री एग्रीमेंट तो मैन पार बढ़ा आए होगा नहीं बंदे त्यो दो बर्स को चाह नहीं छुट्टी काटे रहा है वो जाती दिन बस ना सोचा आप कोई कती दिन के एग्रीमेंट से त्यो तो कंपनी को हाथ मचा क्या सोचा है सोचा है तो बहुत कुछ है लेकिन अबे सपना सकार करने के लिए हम कतार आया है अब यहाँ भी देखता हूँ कि अपने मुलुक से भी ज़्यादा दुख उठाना पड़ता है अब क्या ले आया है और क्या करेगा अब क्या बता सकते हैं अपने ज़िंदगी का लाइफ बढ़ाने के लिए हम मेहनत कर रहा है अब जितना होगा होगा नहीं होगा तो क्या करेंगे The lives of the impoverished migrant workers who poured into the Gulf states illustrate just how difficult it is to bridge the gap between the aspirations and the reality of Islamic economic ethics. These workers came with dreams of a better life. Now they face the reality of 12-hour shifts, poor pay and one day off a week. While the Gulf states import labor and expertise from overseas, Turkey's booming economy is entirely homegrown. Straddling Europe and Asia, the country is in a unique position, and not only geographically. In recent years, Turkey's export revenue has trebled, and its average growth rate of 6% is higher than any in Europe. One factor driving the boom is industrialization in the long neglected east of the country. 800 kilometers from Istanbul, Anatolian businessmen have built a network founded on Islamic values. They've been dubbed the Islamic Calvinists. The begriff is so to understand that the Calvinists, ja, aufgrund ihrer religiösen Überzeugung, ihre wirtschaftlichen Aktivitäten im Diesseits auf die 
sozusagen Entlohnungen jenseits ausgerichtet haben. Sie waren sparsam, arbeitsam, haben investiert, haben ihr Kapital nicht brach liegen lassen. Und genau das sind Eigenschaften, die wir jetzt auch in Anatolien finden bei Unternehmern, deren Religion der Islam ist. Aber die Charaktereigenschaften, die Ausprägungen sind sehr vergleichbar mit dieser protestantischen Richtung, die ja von Max Weber als Begründung für den Aufstieg des kapitalistischen Amerika genutzt wurden. This new class of religious entrepreneurs represents a current of Islam that is open to technical innovation and a free market economy. The huge industrial district around the city of Kaisere in central Anatolia produces furniture, household goods and food. In 2010, its 850 businesses had a workforce of 60,000 and often ran three shifts a day. The combined turnover was over 6 billion Australian dollars. Milkai, a company specializing in textile recycling, funds its investments out of savings or profits. Nonetheless, Taher Nuzachan, the company's founder and director, cannot always observe the Islamic prohibition on interest. Bizim e, müteşebbislerimiz, yatırımcılarımız uzun vadeli yani bugün pazarlığa tabi dediğimiz yatırım yapacaktır. Mesela 5 milyon euroluk bir yatırım yapacaktır. Bunu gider 2 yıl ödemesiz, 5 yıl ödemeli. Faiz miktarında da örnek diyorum anlaşmak şartıyla yatırım niteliğinde kullanırlar. Yani birçok da ticari hayatta e, bizim organize sanayimizde para alıp da para satan tüccar yoktur. Yani mutlaka mal alıp satıyordur. Hassas bir nokta tabii biz şimdi faizi helal dememiz mümkün değil. Ama yatırım olduğu için bir çıkış kapısı olduğunu düşünüyoruz. Caiz diyemeyiz yok. Nasıl caiz Af kapısı vardır. Ya Rabbi biz siz hem bizi affetleriz biz. Also für den mittelständischen Geschäftsmann gibt es glaube ich in der Praxis gar keine gewaltigen Unterschiede zwischen konventionellem und islamischem Finanzwesen, weil das Verbot Zinsen zu nehmen bedeutet, dass man keine verzinslichen Gelddarlehen ausgeben, ausleihen kann oder aufnehmen sollte. Allerdings kann man diese verzinslichen Gelddarlehen etwa für den Geschäftsmann dadurch ersetzen, dass die Bank statt Liquidität Güter bereitstellt, also Handelswaren, die benötigt werden, Maschinen, die benötigt werden, vermietet. Und insofern ändert sich nur die Vertragsgrundlage, auf der die Finanzierung beruht, die Finanzierung vom ökonomischen her, die Möglichkeit, Kapital von anderen, der Sparer zum Beispiel, zurückzugreifen, ändert sich dadurch nicht. Das heißt, es ist ein juristischer Unterschied, zunächst mal noch nicht ein, Einzel ein, ein betriebswirtschaftlicher Unterschied. Zakaria Josh Kuhn comes from Eseli, a village in central Anatolia. Like many of his peers, he had no vocational training. So, after his military service, he left his village in search of work. Then he heard from friends that in Kayseri, they were looking for workers. Bizim buralarda yaygın olan gurbetçilik dediğimiz şey, inşaat üzerine, diğer büyük illere, daha da büyük illere, güneydeki veya batıdaki illere, gurbe inşaat işine gitmeye başlardık o zaman da. Boyacılık, sıva, kalıp, inşaat üzerine çalışmaya başlardık. Diğer illere giderdik o zaman. Yurt dışına çıkmaya düşünmedim şimdi, Hadi çıkamazdı tabi belki. Şimdi meslektaşlarımız içinde her yerde var hemen Kayseri'nin doğu tarafındaki olan illerimizden. Her taraftan var, Sivas'tan var, Yozgat'tan var, Adıyaman'dan var, Erzurum'dan var, Adana'dan var, güneyden. Her Nevşehir'den var, her yerden Kayseri'ye göç olarak geliyor arkadaşlarla beraber çalışıyoruz. Şimdi e, Kayseri'de işsizlik oranı yok, İş, işsiz, işsizlik yok diyecek kadar az. Ben ilk geldiğim yer burası. 15 years ago, Zakaria started out at Milkai Textiles as an untrained worker. Today, he is in charge of quality control. The recycling company produces goods ranging from towels to rugs and mattresses, and even materials used in resurfacing roads. The success of Milkai Textiles shows that Islam and modernity can coexist. It's taken for granted in Kayseri that every company will provide staff prayer rooms just as it provides staff training.
Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The owners of the local factories feel a strong sense of responsibility to the community. Their dedication has deep roots in the traditions of Islamic welfare. Schools and cultural institutions, scholarships and even roads and hospitals are funded by private donations. After an early shift starting at 7 a.m., Zakaria returns home in the late afternoon to Ebaji, a classic working-class district in Kaisere. Here he shares a 60-square-meter apartment with his wife, his two children and his mother-in-law. <laughs> He earns $650 a month, just enough to get by on. Sure. <laughs> Şimdi geçeni konuşmak gerekirse dine saygılı olmayan birisiyle çalışmadım ben. Artık işte bir babacan seven bir insan Tahir Bey. Biz de kendisiyle beraber bizi hiç işçiler olarak değil ortaklar olarak görür devamlı. Bizim için para bir amaç teşkil etmiyor. Bizim için para bir araç. Yani bu araç ne demektir? İnsanların sosyal yaşantısını güçlendiren, insanlara insanlara biraz daha mutluluk ve müreffeh bir hayat sağlayan bir araç. Amaç yapan insanların mutlu olamayacağını düşünüyoruz. Biz de onun için amaç değil de para, araç. İnsanların hayatın gelişmesinde bir araçtır. Onu da hak ettiği şekilde israf etmeden kullanmayı amaçlamaktayız biz. Yani paylaşılmamak, paylaşılmayan bir dünyada mutlu olmak mümkün değil. Tahir Nuzachan embodies the type of paternal businessman that has become very rare in Western economies, driven as they are by shareholder value. Of course, this is not to say that there are no social differences between the factory owner and his workers. Milkai Textiles works three shifts around the clock. Its products are exported to 42 countries, and the yearly turnover is around 77 million dollars. Kolay gelsin. Hayırlı işler. Merhaba, hayırlı işler. Ne var ne yok? Is it really possible to finance a company of this size in a way that complies with Sharia law? olmadan bu kuruluşu şu anda kuramaz. Normal şimdi bankalarla çalışıyoruz tabi. Katılım bankalarını tercih etmiyoruz. Ben arzu ederdim ki onlarla çalışmaya ama onların şartları da normal bankalardan daha zor. Ben şimdi bir dönem şunu yaşadım burada. Faizli bankaya gittim kredi borcumu erken ödedim. Faizli banka kredi borcumu düştü. Faizi düştü. Faizin iskonta yaptı parayı erken ödediğim için. Katılım bankasına gittim. Dedim ki al şu borcumu ödüyorum sana. Hayır dedi, tam ödeyeceksin. Ben sana oradan kar payından düşme yapmam dedi. Düşmedi kar payından. Parayı veremedik. Though it is still a secular state, Turkey has become a model for enlightened Muslims in the Arab world. It has reconciled religion, public life and business in a most undogmatic way. The bemerkenswert is that these so-called Anatolic Tiger or Islamic Calvinists in der Regel sehr religiöse Personen sind und aus ihrer religiösen Erzeug Überzeugung heraus motiviert unternehmerisch tätig geworden sind. Denn der Islam äh, ist eine Religion, die die Eigenverantwortlichkeit, die eigene Leistung betont, Privateigentum betont, Märkte betont. Und dieses zusammengenommen führt eigentlich zu einer sehr effizienten Unternehmerwirtschaft. 
und nicht zu dem, was wir häufig vom Islam glauben, beobachten zu können, Fatalismus und Allah wird schon richten und sozusagen Passivität. Nein, im Gegenteil, hier ist es genau in die andere Richtung gegangen. In the Gulf, business driven by huge oil revenues is still seeking a path of its own as it tries to find a balance between centuries old religious traditions and the profit model of Western economic systems. In the Gulf states, guest workers labor for an average of barely $250 per month. This is at a time when, according to the Emirates Industrial Bank, regional oil revenues have risen to $424 billion. When the property bubble burst in 2008, it marked a new phase in the hitherto unstoppable growth of the Gulf states. For the first time, all-out capitalism was questioned. The crisis led to a rethink. In a region once known for its rampant consumerism, investments are now being made with an eye to the post-oil era. Sharia compliant finance is playing an ever greater role. Islamic scholars are called on to decide whether particular projects meet religious requirements. À partir du moment où la finance est développée, euh, un certain nombre de scholars, comme on dit, de, de sages, euh, ont, ont, ont suggéré d'appliquer les principes de l'islam, c'est-à-dire l'interdiction du taux d'intérêt à la finance, et la finance islamique a commencé à se développer. Une des difficultés dans le développement de la finance islamique tient à ce que chaque structure d'investissement est accompagnée de ce qu'on appelle un charia board, un, un conseil d'administration euh, éthique qui définit les types d'investissements qu'on peut accepter et ceux qu'on ne peut pas accepter. Et les charia boards n'ont pas toutes la même position. Donc, euh, en fait, il y a une relative hétérogénéité de la finance islamique qui est un frein à son développement. And then once you've put together a particular structure, um, you generally need um, a statement that what you've provided is a Sharia compliant product. And that statement, um, you know, people call it a pronouncement or a fatwa, um, would come from an Islamic scholar who was familiar not just with Islamic principles, but also with financial um, markets and structures. So the scholar would review um, the, the documents that we had created and would then issue, I suppose, the equivalent of a legal opinion to say that in his opinion, this structure was Sharia compliant. The annual conference of the Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions meeting in Manama, the capital of Bahrain. Politicians, bankers, and above all, religious scholars have gathered to clarify basic issues of Islamic financial economics. At the conference is Sheikh Nizam Yaqubi, often said to be the most influential Sharia scholar of all. Along with the colonial era came certain legal systems and also the banking system. However, the majority of the Muslims uh, did not accept the interest uh, uh, model. Even if they deposited their funds for safekeeping or so in certain areas, but in many, many countries, they are underbanked. And the reason for that is that they don't believe and the interest-bearing system. <clears throat> so after the colonial powers were, you know, leaving the country, many intellectuals started to ask for return back to the original system. The system has been there, but it has not been documented. It has not been put on papers. It was not turned into institutional type of business. It is only in the early 70s that the business took on an institutional form. A few banks were uh, formed and they labeled themselves as uh, Islamic banks and they transacted in an Islamic way that complied with Sharia principles and rules. The stronger the growth of Islamic finance, the greater the need for informed advice. But the number of Sharia scholars is limited. In the whole world, there are just 300 of them to share the thousand or so counseling contracts, the so-called Sharia mandates. Their influence on Islamic business finance is therefore considerable.
Many legal scholars sit on Sharia boards, in banks, insurance companies, funds and indexed funds. But with so many scholars in these positions, can they really be called independent advisors? Or are they themselves stakeholders in the financial institutions? Also wenn ich zwischen diesen Bildern wählen dürfte, dann würde ich sagen, es sind eher selbstständige Berater, die von der Bank bezahlt werden. Zum einen gibt es keine Kirche in dem Sinne, zum anderen sind es relativ wenige Experten, die auch zum Teil durch nicht standardisierte Ausbildungsgänge Expertise erworben haben, Anerkennung gefunden haben zwischen, unter ihren Kollegen und deswegen eine relativ kleine Gruppe von sehr prominenten Scharia-Gelehrten im Augenblick tonangebend sind, so etwa 30 bis 35 sind. Man kommt es sehr darauf an, wie der einzelne Rechtsgelehrte äh, die Buchstaben des Vertrages und die Buchstaben der Scharia miteinander in Übereinklang bringt, wobei ich bei den Buchstaben der Scharia schon gezögert habe, weil es gibt kein geschriebenes Gesetzbuch, sondern es gibt Rechtsschulen, unterschiedliche Rechtsschulen, die unterschiedliche Prinzipien und unterschiedliche Methoden der Rechtsfindung äh, jeweils verfolgen. In 2007, a scandal erupted at the Accounting and Auditing Conference. One of the most prominent, but also most controversial legal scholars, Pakistani Sheikh Taki Usmani, alleged that 85% of the so-called shukuks, or Islamic loan products, were not Sharia compliant. The shukuks were only a relatively small proportion of the Islamic bank's portfolio, but his comments sparked intense debate. To what extent may the Islamic financial world take its lead from the Western one? Since the current financial crisis began, both conservative and liberal representatives of Islamic financial theory have emphasized that such a thing would be unthinkable in their system. When money is traded, no uh, extra asset has been created. I have lent money to you and claim some interest on it, and that's it. So no new, uh, new asset has been created. But as Islam, through its injections, has provided a system of financing where every and every, each and every single transaction of financing is backed by asset. It cannot be merely, uh, merely uh, trading in money that has been multiplied by the, uh, the so-called uh, derivatives. You know that the derivatives, the worth of derivatives uh, has uh, grown to the extent of uh, eight, uh, 12 times more than the GDP of the whole world, while there is nothing behind them, no asset at all, no real economy, just numbers fed in the, in the computers. In the Gulf states, the growth of the Islamic financial industry is more apparent than anywhere else. The largest sovereign wealth funds in the world have at their disposal huge amounts of capital that must be invested. But not even the Islamic financial world can escape the pressures of growing competition in the international capital and financial markets. So it too constantly thinks up new financial products to generate growth and offer attractive profit potential. And like Western banks, most Islamic banks are also governed by shareholder interests. Is the Islamic financial world nonetheless more stable than the Western banking system? Le cœur philosophique, c'est le partage du risque. Quand une banque française, allemande ou américaine prête à un client, que ce soit une entreprise ou, ou à une personne physique, euh, elle perçoit un, prêt un, un taux d'intérêt et donc elle, elle sait à l'avance euh, l'argent qu'elle va recevoir. Il n'y a pas de partage de risque. Alors, la crise, c'est euh, le refus d'assumer le risque. Euh, je prends l'exemple des crédits subprime, les crédits hypothécaires aux États-Unis euh, faits à des ménages qui avaient peu de ressources. C'est ça l'origine de la crise en, actuelle, euh, euh, origine qui remonte à 2007. Euh, ces crédits étaient titrisés 
terme technique qui est très simple, qui consiste à transférer le risque. Donc par rapport à ça, le principe philosophique de la finance islamique qui est de dire on ne transfère pas le risque, on ne se défausse pas, on ne se garantit pas, mais on partage, me paraît adapté à la période actuelle. Wenn Sie sich die westliche Bankenszene angucken, dann haben wir große Probleme bei den international aktiven Investmentbanken, aber die regional orientierten Banken, die Banken mit einer starken Einlagenbasis, Sparkassen, Genossenschaftsbanken und ähnliches sind relativ gut durch die Krise gekommen. Und so ähnlich von den ökonomischen Charakteristika sind auch islamische Banken. Diese Prototypen für mehr spekulative Geschäfte oder für, für, für Transaktionen, die spekulativen Charakter haben können, sind noch keineswegs in weiter Anwendung, sondern das sind, wie gesagt, erste Versuche. Es gibt aus meiner Sicht durchaus Triebkräfte in diese Richtung, weil das der Bereich ist, in dem besonders hohe Gewinne zu realisieren sind, in der Finanzwirtschaft selber. The Dubai Stock Exchange, the Islamic financial system, has joined the world of high finance. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones has an Islamic market index. And the Western financial world has been positive about the funding of major projects with a combination of conventional and Sharia-compliant investments. One of the best known is the 2006 Dubai Ports deal, in which United Arab Emirates company took over management of a number of US seaports. The $10 billion investment was financed by a mixture of conventional loans and the Islamic bonds known as shukuks. And so we had interesting issues of um, in, intercreditor um, between the conventional uh, investors, lenders, and the, the Islamic investors in the Sukuk. So it, it was complex, it was large, it was very public, and I do think that that transaction brought um, Islamic capital markets to the, the forefront of the conventional markets. I think they realized the depth of potential liquidity that there was in the Islamic capital markets. I think up until then it had been seen as sort of a specialist niche area. I think the, the real issue is, is there a difference? Um, and what is Islamic finance trying to do? I used the expression smoke and mirrors and it is an allegation that's very commonly made about Islamic finance. I've heard you know, Muslims with a good knowledge of, of finance suggest essentially that, that what, we are, that what we see sometimes is essentially conventional transactions um, dressed up um, in a Sharia-compliant garb. That is one of the key debates that's going on in Islamic finance at the moment. The Islamic financial system is now determined mainly by lawyers and religious scholars. But what about the role of Islamic trading traditions and values in the everyday lives of Gulf businessmen? Inam Abidi Amrovi came to Dubai in 2006. As an Indian Muslim, he hoped to find greater freedom and professional opportunity. If, if I talk about business in general, business is, is all about making money, you know. So if it could be a Muslim making money, it could be a non-Muslim making money. I have met people from both the religion, I mean Hindu maybe, Christian or Muslims. They, they want to do something for the society also and they are very God-fearing people. I've also met people from all sorts of religion and background who have left no stone unturned you know in in making money by hook or crook and it goes the same everywhere whether in uae or in india or anywhere in the world those are the people who will make money by anyhow i i have heard of islamic finance and uh, i am myself you know my own uh, account with hsbc they are all uh, you know islamic account Inam's company deals in electronics and telecommunications products. Like all foreigners, he must have a business partner who is a Dubai national and who also holds at least a 51% share in the company. To Inam, a practicing Muslim, the values of Islam are a bond between him and his partner. All their agreements are based purely on trust. There is no written contract. Any calls for me? 
But are the values that link Inam and his Arab silent partner still typical of everyday business life in the Emirates? Okay, so you stand, I've given you the card. Okay, you have the email ID in His business partner is critical of the excesses of the new Gulf economy. لأن السيارة بالأقساط أثاث المنزل بالأقساط وتقريبا أكثر الأنشطة التجارية أيضا عن طريق البنوك نسبة قليلة تراعي أحكام الإسلام في العمل أو في التجارة بالذات والنسبة العظمى تمشي مع الحياة Not quite two hours drive away is Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates. It's still overshadowed by the glittering Dubai, but Abu Dhabi has huge oil reserves that guarantee it a steady income stream for decades to come. And Abu Dhabi harbors ambitions. In the course of the 21st century, it hopes to become a world city to rival Paris and London. Like all the Gulf states, it has a young, well-educated and cosmopolitan generation waiting to shape the transition to the post-oil era. Rami Al Tayyar works as a manager for an American hotel chain. My father is a bit of um, the old school style, so you know, you walk into his office, there's a lot of paperwork. But you know, nowadays, you know, you always see me on my BlackBerry, sending and receiving emails. Um, even though my father has a BlackBerry, but he refuses to have the um, the whole uh, network uh, networking on it because he simply is like it's too complicated. For me, it's easier to use the, the paperwork is complicated. So it's just a matter of technology, you know. Uh, I grew up with uh, with Playstations and uh, and Sega Genesis, and he grew up with uh, you know just uh, running around and, and playing soccer and. Uh, Rami's father came to Dubai from Egypt before his son was born. He was a professional footballer. His decision to stay on once his sporting career was over was not difficult. The emerging oil boom gave him the opportunity of a lifetime. He too works with the required local partner without a contract on the basis of mutual trust. People here, when he make business with you, not need sign with him contracts. What he said to you, you are believe him. I see very nice people talk with me nice and want to make something new. When I start work with my boss, we we'll start work together like two brothers in one family, one company. For sure, something change, but still, uh, these people, I told you, is living in desert. Desert people, like, not people living in the town, like any country in the world, you know, different. It's still pure, you know, still have nice heart, you know. Uh, I, I'm never ever feel um, work for somebody. And when we are go meet with the people, my boss, he say, we are work together. He not say work for me. This is very important about psychology for anybody, you know. I tell you example, son for my boss, he said to me, uncle, you know, and also my son, he said to my boss, uncle, we say by Arabic, ammi, this meaning my uncle, you know. That's my uncle, that's my father over here. My father has been working with him for the past 40 years, and uh, this man almost raised me, my uncle Ghanem. Love him to bits. This is me when I was young. You can see the little uh, Michael Jackson look over here. This is my mother. Yeah, how are you? She takes care of me, still. 27 years old, I don't care. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. And this is the view I told you guys about. Family, social and political relations remain shaped by patriarchal and autocratic structures. Wealth and power remain in the hands of a few ruling families. While citizens of the Emirates prosper, business development and the country's infrastructure are managed almost entirely by foreigners. Their rights are restricted, their future uncertain. Rami Al Tayyar was born in Abu Dhabi, but he will never be entitled to the passport of the country he calls home. This is my country. This is Abu Dhabi. This is the perfect spot. You know, just to come and, and think for a second. Look back. Every person here, every person that was born here, you know, when he sees this, he feels like, I actually achieved something. I actually helped build this place somehow. It's been told that Muslims are poor. It's true. And how do we relieve them from poverty? You cannot just distribute money. You have to install a system that will enable them to take an opportunity, economic opportunities, investment opportunities, and translate that into uh, life functions such as education, work, you know, uh, better life conditions for all. Islamic economic theory has not created a third way between capitalism and communism. But it does have the potential to make a deep and lasting change to the Muslim world, economically, but above all, socially and politically. The possibility of rayonnement of the Islamic finance is the same as the possibility of rayonnement of the religion of Islam. So I think that. Après la crise, la finance islamique continuera à se développer. Je pense que la finance islamique part, est à la fois différente dans sa philosophie et souvent très proche dans son application. Et j'ai tendance à dire de manière triviale, c'est de la finance anglo-saxonne peinte en verte. Es gibt eine Aufgabe für islamische Banken, die liegt nicht darin, das gleiche noch mal zu erfinden, was wir schon längst haben, nur noch komplizierter. Also die gleichen spekulativen Instrumente auf einer anderen Rechtsgrundlage bringt uns wirklich nicht weiter. Aber vernachlässigte Sektoren, vernachlässigte Unternehmerschichten zu fördern, das wäre, glaube ich, lohnend und auch machbar. The success of the religious entrepreneurs in Anatolia shows that an economy grounded in Islam can play a part in positive social change. Yet, as long as this remains no more than a vision in the Gulf states, Zakaria Joshkun's confession of faith will sound more like a challenge to the ruling classes in the Gulf. Islam is a kind of eşitlik dini. The people are eşit olduğunu, siyahın beyaza, beyazın siyaha, hiçbir üstünün olmadığını, sosyal adaletin tam olduğunu, herkesin Allah katında takvada, yani yapmış olduğu ibadetlerde üstünlük olacağını söylüyor. Yani şeydeki gibi bize bir ırçılık veya bir insanlara kendisinin aileden dolayı, soydan soptan dolayı üstünlüğünü hiçbir zaman kabul etmiyor İslam dini. İslam dininde bir köleyle efendi aynı anda namazını kılabiliyor. Kur'an-ı Kerim'de de var bu. Peygamber Efendimizin hadislerinde de var. Aynı yerde durabiliyor, aynı yemekten yiyebiliyor, aynı arabaya binebiliyor. Hiçbir zaman sınıf ayrımı veya da e, şey başka üstünlük yoktu. Üstünlük sadece yapmış olduğun ibadettedir dinimize so, e, şey olarak. The concept of embedding social equality in an economic system that serves society is not alien to Christian culture either. It's just that this ideal has never prevailed. The same fate appears to be threatening Islamic business ethics. Sophisticated, Sharia-compliant financial products are not signs of a new system striving for development, sustainability and social justice, but of a system aiming to maximize profit under the auspices of religion. Their marketplace is the International Stock Exchange, and ethics and morality never rated very highly there.
In a few minutes, a TV show will begin that is unlike anything we see in the West. The studio audience is made up entirely of rural women who have come to Jakarta from the countryside. Their clothes are color-coded to indicate the regions and villages they come from. Some of them have been waiting for this day for up to two years. This is the day when they will see their idol, Mama Dede, in person for the very first time. The program, an Islamic version of a TV breakfast show, is a mixture of entertainment and religious advice. A million viewers on average tune in every day. Mama Dede is an imam of the airwaves. Tapi sebetulnya kita uh, buka pertanyaan, pertanyaan bebas karena acara Mama A ini uh, mencakup seluruh aspek hidup dan kehidupan manusia. Tapi ternyata tiap hari didominasi oleh pertanyaan tentang keluarga. With laughter all round, the viewers' problems are reduced to two simple questions. Does the Quran say an action is halal, permitted, or is it haram, forbidden? Mama Dede is convinced that this fundamental distinction applies to business relationships and money matters, with repercussions for the hereafter. Kalau di dunia ini kita sudah melakukan perbuatan sesuai syariat agama Islam dengan baik, Allah ridho, insya Allah begitu meninggal pun Allah ridho. Jadi kalau kita melakukan kebaikan di dunia, di akhirat dapat kebaikan. Kalau kita melakukan keburukan di alam dunia, di akhirat dapat keburukan. Artinya kualitas kehidupan kita di alam akhirat tergantung kualitas kehidupan kita di alam dunia. Kalau masalah ekonomi kita tahu yang syariat yang benar, kenapa tidak kita ambil kesempatan ada pilihan anda. Pilihlah yang terbaik buat kita. The rules of Sharia cover not only questions of belief, but also the conduct of daily life. Ever since the birth of Islam, the rules have been interpreted and reinterpreted by religious scholars. Some Muslims live strictly by the rules of Sharia, but the importance of the rules varies from region to region. In Southeast Asia, there is now a banking system based on Sharia. It is winning more and more customers from every social class. Dr. Ruzni Hassan works as an Islamic advisor for a large international bank. Dr. Mustafa Nasution, a Western-educated economist, is convinced that the conventional banking system cannot work in this part of the world. Puan Jamaluddin is the head of a Sharia-based Islamic bank. Iqbal Muhaimin is a financial expert who would like to return to the time of Muhammad when prosperity was measured in goats. These four people all have one thing in common. They are profiting from a new development in Southeast Asia, the growing sense of religious identity amongst Muslims. One has seen that with the global resurgence in Islam, with the influence of Afghanistan and the struggle by the Mujahideen there, which uh, created great interest in Southeast Asia, uh, Islam has become a bigger factor in the political development of Southeast Asia. This change has had its effect in the financial and banking sector. Sebagian besar lebih karena memang sesuai syariat agama yang kita anut. Karena kalau bank syariah dan bank konvensional sudah sama, pelayanannya sudah sama bagus, jaringannya sudah sama bagus, fasilitasnya sama, sudah sama sudah bagus. Banyak. Bedanya cuma yang satu sesuai syariah, yang, yang satu, satu konvensional, konvensional, kenapa enggak yang syariah? Western economists too are interested in the potential of Sharia banking. But so far, skeptical voices predominate, and not only in the Western world. Because to me, banking, Islamic and banking, are two contradictory words. You cannot join them. Banking, uh, as I studied and as the whole world knows, started from Lombardian Jews 
in Italy. So what makes Islamic banking different from conventional banking? What religious laws does it observe? Who is behind it? And can the West learn from it? Friday in the mosque at Pekan on the east coast of Malaysia. About 60% of the Malaysian population is Muslim. Islam has particularly strong roots in the countryside. Dan malam peristiwa malam ini merupakan satu peristiwa yang berlaku kepada Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam di zamannya. Mereka dia telah di telah dibawa berjalan malam dari Masjidil Haram ke Masjidil Aqsa dan diangkat ke langit untuk menerima perintah daripada Tuhan. Sunday in St. George's Anglican Church in Singapore. The development of modern Asia has close links with Christianity. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your Ever since the first European explorers, merchants and colonialists arrived in Asia, close trading ties have helped spread and establish Christianity. Lead us not into temptation. The rise of capitalism in Christian Europe and the United States laid the foundations for a globalized economy in Asia as well. In this economics class at a university in Jakarta, there is a lot of discussion about the reckless, profit-driven behavior of bankers in the build-up to the global financial crisis. Oh my God. <laughs> That's the demand. Please, don't underestimate us. We may not be regard to the graveyard. You know, please, have some respect for my ancestor. It's very important in our culture. Please, keep that in mind, okay? Go ahead. I know that there are problems with um, uh, the way that the West has developed. There are all kinds of issues that people keep raising, and I think that's legitimate because, you know, the track record is, at times has not been terribly good. But I think uh, one of the things that is fairly fixed in my mind is that, that, that uh, uh, many of our Western values, the values we take for granted, things like the um, sanctity of human life, um, the importance of, uh, uh, of uh, love and care for people. These things are grounded in the scriptures, in the Bible, the Old and New Testaments. Have these values been lost in the capitalist system? And do they live on in the Islamic economic model? This is Old Jakarta, the Dutch quarter from the 16th century. Actually, Indonesia is uh, a country with a lot of uh, resources. So, uh, especially in the spices or minerals. So, the, the Dutch came here in order to get these resources for the welfare of the people, the Dutch people especially. Dr. Nasution views the Western economic system with skepticism. Basically, I'm a capitalistic economist. But uh, since I studied this knowledge deeper and deeper, and I realized there's something wrong with the system. So I try to educate myself in Sharia economics. Sharia law follows the rules of the Quran and the Sunnah, the teachings of Muhammad. The Islamic banking system must do the same. 
Investment in alcohol, pork, gambling or pornography is prohibited. Interest and speculation are also prohibited. The costs must be transparent. The borrower and the lender must each share the risk and the profit. About the time that Dr. Nasution began his career, Jonathan Addis started work as a banker in the Gulf states. Back then, hardly anyone practiced Sharia-compliant banking, even there. It didn't exist as far as I was aware, aware of it, really. Um, it, was a, it was a sort of... I think it existed, from what I've gathered historically, but we, we, so we certainly weren't using Sharia concepts. Um, in, in, I was in Abu Dhabi, which is in the United Arab Emirates, and um, we didn't have any Sharia products to offer people. This is back in the 81, 82 sort of time. Today, it's very different. Monday morning in the Sheraton Imperial in Kuala Lumpur, shortly before the start of an Asian conference on Islamic finance. Islamic banking is booming. In Malaysia alone, 20% of total banking is Sharia compliant. A conference like this one is held somewhere in the Muslim world almost every month. The speakers and the conference delegates come from across the whole region. Mulya Sirigar is a key figure. He heads the Indonesian State Bank's Sharia Compliance Department, which is responsible for Islamic banking. But what exactly is behind the concept of Islamic banking? How is it different from Western banking? One basic principle is that money must be generated only by profits from trading actual goods or services. Speculating to make a profit is forbidden. Making money over money is actually prohibited. So making money over money is actually uh, what you deem as interest. But in Islamic principle, what you can do is you can actually allow trade. That means I have the goods, I sell it to you for a profit, and it is the profit that actually uh, is the consideration for granting the financing. In Islamic banking, the cost of financing a loan is set in advance. Both the lender and the borrower know from the outset exactly what the final cost will be. Advocates of Sharia-compliant finance say such transactions are transparent and safe because the cost is fixed. There can be no fluctuations as a result of variable interest rates on mortgage loans, for example. Huan Jamaluddin is the Malaysian head of the Kuwait Finance House, a branch of the Middle East Bank. Since its foundation 30 years ago, the bank has been one of the pioneers of Islamic banking. The Kuwait Finance House lays claim to strict observance of Sharia principles. If Shara said that we are not allowed because it, it sort of is against the Shara principle, then we don't do that activity. So as far as we're concerned, we place Shara above even our board. That means to say Sharia's decision matters. The fashion industry has discovered the purchasing power of Muslims. Islam prescribes a particular dress code for women. Clothing must not accentuate the body, and the upper body and hair must be completely covered. Islamic dress that complies with this code and is still fashionable is becoming more and more popular. In Kuala Lumpur, many women dress according to the precepts of the Quran. They don't reveal much in public. But that doesn't mean they only wear black. Islamic fashion can be colorful.
Moses Law and Eric Yong, fashion designers with their own label and stores, are experts on Sharia-compliant fashion. Mostly Muslim, they have to cover their hand. They only appear the face only, the, even the neck also have to cover. But we have to change the, the mind of people to looking the Muslim. It's so conservative. So we, we design our thing is more modern and elegant. Not even the Muslim woman, uh, even non-Muslim women also can wear our designs. Moses and Eric Styles reflect Western fashion trends with a few restrictions. And then uh, this one, okay. For, Mus for non-Muslim, they can wear like this, without the sleeve. So we this design one, another piece. This one is for the Muslim people. So we clasp the sleeve there, and then put some of uh, sorry, uh, crystals, look more elegant and nice. Yeah. That is different. That's a different. That difference is come out. Yeah. Actually, it's a one design. Sharia-compliant fashion and Western fashion exist side by side, just like Sharia-compliant banks and conventional banks. More and more conventional banks in Southeast Asia now offer Islamic products as well. HSBC, founded almost 150 years ago, is one of the largest. It's a global business. I mean, the Islamic world is global, um, and we are glo a global bank, so it, it seemed appropriate to us. We're very strong in the, um, in the Islamic world. We have a very significant presence in places like Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Middle East, but also um, in Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, so, that was, so that was quite relevant as well. Um, it's fast growing. I mean, it was even back then, it was seen to be an area that was going to grow faster than, con than conventional banking. Um, and we see that now. The, the, in Malaysia, the uh, Islamic assets, if you like, in the, in the banking industry are growing faster than the conventional assets. So the percentage will increase. HSBC takes advice from experts such as Dr. Hassan. This is my son, my only son, and uh, Adam. And he is uh, 10 years old, okay? Mm -hmm. And my little girl, okay? Mm -hmm. She is Iman Noha. And then how old are you? Seven. Seven years old. And she is seven years old. And yes. of course, my lovely yeah. husband, <laughs> very supporting of me. <laughs> and my daughter, my angel, okay? She is Iman Noha. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, Iman Sofia. Okay, and he is, she is. How many years old are you? Twelve. Twelve years old. Okay. Okay. The family starts the day. Dr. Hassan will take her children to school before going to work at her university. Islam is far more moderate in Southeast Asia than in most parts of the Muslim world. Well-educated women who manage a career as well as a family are not unusual. My priority, of course, goes to the children, being the mother and being the wife to the husband. At the same time, also, I like what I am doing now, teaching in the universities as well as my contribution to the Islamic finance industry. Malaysia has taken a leading role in Islamic finance in the region. In Malaysia, Islamic banking accounts for about 20% of all bank assets. When these children are adults, the figure will probably be 30%. But the global holdings of Islamic banks come to less than 1.3 trillion Australian dollars. That is only 2% of total bank assets. Islamic banks offer similar products to those of conventional banks construction finance, credit cards and insurance. 
Each product is assessed for Sharia compliance. A Sharia compliant product must charge fees rather than interest. It must be completely transparent and it must avoid commodities that Sharia deems haram, forbidden. The banks have Sharia committees of Islamic scholars and experts who examine new financial products and evaluate their Sharia compliance. Dr. Hassan is a member of HSBC's Sharia committee. My primary duty here in the university is teaching. And since I'm specializing in Islamic finance, so I'm teaching the subjects of uh, Islamic law of transaction and also the Islamic banking and takaful. Uh, in addition to that, of course, I do research because that is what is expected of an academician. I mean that to do research. So I'm doing research on Islamic finance. You shouldn't be causing harm on others. The huge growth in the Islamic financial sector has created a demand for more and more Sharia-compliant products. This in turn has spawned a growing need for experts in the field. The decisions of the scholars on the different bank committees are not always uniform, but they do distinguish between activities that are merely Sharia-oriented and those that are Sharia-compliant. Together. We'll be working in a team normally with the marketing, with, uh, with other risk, treasury and whatnot to come up with a good uh, Islamic or Shara compliant product which is also good, marketable and then it gives a good profit to the institution as well. So that is what we are looking, basically we are focusing on the Shara compliant aspect. That's our job. The importance of the Islamic banking industry prompted the Malaysian Central Bank to found a special university for Islamic finance. The subject ranges from uh, Sharia, Islamic law, a contract, a little bit about Islamic jurisprudence, uh, learning the sources of uh, Islamic finance from the Quran, the prophetic traditions and the saying. Datu Agilnat himself, a former banker, stresses that Islamic banks must deal with the same challenges as any other banks. A risk knows no religion, whether, whether you're a Muslim, Hindu, Christian uh, or, or, or any other religion, you know, you are faced with risks every day and, and, and the, the, the, we teach what risk is all about. <laughs> These MBA students from the United States are on a research tour of Asia and are particularly interested in Sharia-compliant banking. It's a rising part of the world. Uh, it, the relationships between the United States and the Islamic world are very tenuous in many, uh, many situations. And so uh, the more all of us know about each other and the more we know about how they do things, uh, I think the better off everybody will be. After 9-11, the Western world was intensely suspicious of Islam. But advocates of the Islamic banking system, such as Puan Jamaluddin, maintain that ethical values and the quest for justice are the cornerstone of the Quran, and thus of the Islamic financial system. In Southeast Asia, Islamic finance attempts to combine modernity with traditional values. Islam in Southeast Asia has always been very moderate and very accommodating. Barry Wayne, a journalist who lives in Singapore, has studied the region all his life. Well, in fact, this is uh, old Southeast Asia and New Southeast Asia, and the best example you could have here in Singapore. The old shopper houses here have been reconverted into restaurants and bars for locals and visitors. And right behind them, uh, you see the skyscrapers. This is the heart of modern Singapore. And this is a monument to the moneylenders and merchants of the colonial era. These days, modern businesswomen in suits are the prevailing image of the city. Singapore has become a financial hub with bright opportunities for these children. I arrived here uh, almost 40 years ago. It was largely a, an agricultural Southeast Asia, underdeveloped. It was not a place that uh, important as uh, the future. 
uh, when you're in the downtown areas, as we are in here in Singapore, you know, you might be downtown in uh, Manhattan. The cities, of course, have boomed and uh, the economies generally have done extremely well. Tens, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. But there is another side to the story. A lot of Southeast Asian countries are in danger of losing their culture, uh, certainly in the big cities. Some, particularly Singapore, that are, are aware of this process have made a particular attempt to try and preserve the old alongside the new. But at the moment, the desire to develop and to compete internationally and to be modern uh, is overwhelming the, the rest of the uh, inclination to sort of preserve the past. Singapore's success grew out of political aspirations for economic growth. Malaysia had the same goal. It too wanted economic growth and it didn't always embrace Islamic banking. It did so because of a different set of political imperatives. In the face of this globalization uh, and this global resurgence of Islam, uh, Dr. Mahathir, when he was Prime Minister, Islamized his own government to head off any opposition so that someone couldn't outpoint him politically. So again, the effect of that uh, was to start Islamic institutions like banks and to have uh, Sharia institutions out, other, other Sharia institutions in business. Today, Kuala Lumpur is the center of Islamic finance in Southeast Asia. And like Singapore and Malaysia, the other countries of the region are moving from a post-colonial way of life to a modern Western one with a distinctive Asian stamp. At the same time, there is a new Islamic awareness. So how can consumerism be reconciled with Islam? And what part will Islamism play? In Islam, we are not talking about something that is bad at all time. Terrorists and, and what not, no, but rather than we are contributing in all aspects. That is a very remote aspect on jihad thing and, and what not. But the majority of Muslim, regardless of male or female, we are contributing in other aspects of life. The rules of Sharia are the focal point in the life of a devout Muslim. But as with Sharia compliant finance, the rules are not so much a written code as a matter of ongoing interpretation by scholars. All praise be to Allah, Master of the Universe. Praise of those who praised you. Praise that provide a blessing and reward increasing. For non-Muslims, it's not always easy to understand these precepts and prohibitions. Puan Jamaluddin and the team from the Kuwait Finance House have done a deal with the Japanese financial giant Nomura. A hundred million US dollars have been invested in a shukuk, the Sharia version of a bond. With a shukuk, there is no interest. Instead, the loan capital is paid for with an agreed lending fee. It amounts to an interest-bearing loan, with the interest at a fixed rate. But to retain compliance with Sharia, no one mentions the word interest. And also it is a great pleasure for us to be able to stand in front of you. And basically, uh, whenever we approach our clients with new financing ideas, we would now like to invite both With Namura's entry into Islamic finance, the Japanese bankers have broadened their product range. It's also a coup for Islamic banking. The deal will finance, among other things, the purchase of two airliners. But as these airliners are destined for two European carriers, alcohol and pork will undoubtedly be served on board. How can this be Sharia compliant? The business of flying the aircraft and getting money out of you charging people through the ticket, right? Your business is not because you go and sell liquor or you sell pork. Your main activity is transportation. So is it all just a matter of interpretation, even of labelling? In the 1970s, Hussein Najadi came to Malaysia from the Middle East. We're seeing the old Chinatown, the old trading posts, and this is where CIMB is. I started the Arab Malaysia Bank. 
dealing with the small traders, small savers, and financing their import, their exports to the region. Uh, this is where it, it started, the whole thing. Hussein Najadi is well versed in business, from running a market stall to the global financial system. He came to Malaysia with two million US dollars from Arab investors, developed good ties with leading Malaysian figures, and founded Ambank, which now has almost 200 branches all over Malaysia. Mr. Najadi came under pressure to rebrand Ambank as an Islamic bank. But to him, high finance is incompatible with Islam. And I said to the government, because uh, your source of funds are taxation, money earned, partially Islamic, halal, and partially haram, non-Islamic, you mixed it, you mingle it, and together, and that source of capital is not Islamic. You charge taxation on hotels, on entertainment, on cabarets, on alcohol, on porks, on gambling. And then how do you, when you mingle it together under one account called treasury, how do you want to use the treasury funds to start Islamic banking? This one? Ten. Ten no Nobody's got Mr. Najadi is convinced that Islamic banking should exist principally for people like these traders in Kuala Lumpur's central market. The origin of the money is important, but what is even more important is how it is invested and who profits from it. They should invest from where the money comes from, the origination of saving, the origination of savers are from the villages from the small traders like these. In my view, it should come back to these people in a form of economic partnership, not as a lending, because then if we lend it, then becomes the Western Lombardian Jewish banking called Banka. So this is where the Islamic economy, in my view, should take shape. Jakarta is huge and hectic. 10 million people live in the city proper and several million more on the fringes. Times are good in Indonesia. The economy is growing at a rate of 6% a year. The local advocates of an Islamic financial system are demanding a fairer distribution of the proceeds of this boom. The Saria finance should make benefit to all group of the people. Not only the people who have money, actually. But right now, since we are, we are in a dual economic system, most of the people working with the capitalistic system and the other with the Saria system, so people have, uh, with the money can get more benefit than most of the people. Some people indeed don't benefit. In Chilinching, a coastal suburb of Jakarta, almost every family lives in poverty. Even basic things like fresh water are a problem. For people like Carnita, poverty and debt go hand in hand mainly because moneylenders charge a high rate of interest. Waktu itu kan mas kepepet utang apa masalah kalau nomor orang tua terus kita lari ke Jakarta kita merantau ngebantu cari pembantu pas ketemu sama sama suaminya bapaknya anak-anak terus kawin ya alhamdulillah dikaruniai anak tiga sampai sekarang
In this poor district, the social aspect of Islamic finance is especially important. Women, mothers, the people who feed their families and often bear sole responsibility for them suffer most from the poverty. And one aspect of Islamic finance is welfare. All Muslims are expected to donate 2.5% of their income to charitable causes. In Chilinching, the money goes to the poor, not as a gift, but as interest-free loans. Ya mengembalikannya itu bulanan sebulan katanya sih 200 sebulan. Tapi jangka lima bulan jangkanya satu juta. Carnita borrowed 110 US dollars. It's not a lot in the West, but in Indonesia, it's enough to start a business. Carnita sells food on the street. Ya, alhamdulillah nyaman sih bu. Ya, karena kalau rumah jakat kan ibaratnya nggak ada uang bunganya. Itu kan bersih. Ibaratnya kita minjem satu juta kembaliin satu juta lagi kalau pinjam di orang kan ada seperti ada bunganya gitu In Islamic finance there are two sides to charity it helps the poor but it benefits the donor too You have to look for complete welfare. What I mean is welfare for the here in the world, also welfare in the hereafter. So, according to the system, the world is, is only a temporary world. What we are going to do is we have to prepare for our life hereafter. In this world, we have to try to make a good thing, to make a just thing through the economic something like that. Eighty-five percent of Indonesians are Muslim. The Istiqlal Mosque in Jakarta is the largest in Southeast Asia. Friday prayers are the high point of the week. Counting the galleries and courtyards, the mosque is large enough for 120,000 worshippers to join in prayer. The Indonesian government supports the expansion of Islamic banking with subsidies and special development schemes, incentives that aim to exploit the full potential of the Islamic market. With almost 240 million people, Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world. Near the mosque are the twin towers of Indonesia's central bank. With eight buildings and over 5,000 employees, it draws up the nation's fiscal policy. The government stipulates that Islamic banks should confine the major part of their investments to Indonesia in order to boost the economy. Right now, the stage is what we are doing is uh, to develop Islamic banking and finance side by side with conventional uh, banking and finance means that uh, 
we want both of them can serve the people, can serve the, the market. Because a long time ago, uh, people have no choice. They just know about conventional bank and conventional finance. Ten years ago, the Indonesian government began laying the political foundations for Islamic banking. Today, according to the central bank, the sector is growing at 35% a year. First of all, there's a demand from the people. Based on our survey, about 40% believe that this bank is suitable with their Islamic teaching. Dr. Siregar emphasizes that the arguments in favor of Islamic banking are not only religious, but also economic. Second thing, I think government needs a fund to develop uh, this economy. The sources of funds, not only from conventional, we need also from Syria. So actually, uh, with developing Islamic finance in Indonesia, uh, it is possible to attract uh, funds from uh, many countries uh, in order to finance our economy. Although 35% of Indonesians say they're in favor of an Islamic banking system, Sharia-compliant investments make up only 3% of the whole. Tula Hidayah, seen here with his son Bumi and wife Tita, has chosen an Islamic bank. Tita is a housewife who earns a little money selling batik ware. soal keuangan sejak saya menikah saya percaya sekali kalau uh, kalau istri itu menteri keuangan dalam keluarga jadi untuk soal keuangan saya serahkan kepada istri saya uh, ya setelah menikah saya memutuskan uh, menabung dan berinvestasi di syariah di suatu bank syariah uh, dengan tujuannya sih kita ingin mengikuti syariat agama yang kita anut. Selain itu, fasilitas sekarang uh, sudah ada di mana-mana. There is little difference between conventional and Islamic banks in terms of the costs, returns and administration. But the motivation of the clients is quite different. Jadi uh, saya ingin memulai hidup saya untuk anak saya pendidikan uh, dengan sesuai syariat agama yang saya anut. Jadi kenapa saya nggak memulai sesuatu itu untuk anak saya yang ke depan dengan sesuatu yang syariah sesuai dengan agama. It's like going to a restaurant. In Indonesia and Malaysia, you can choose from the menus of the conventional and Islamic banks and pick whatever is most appealing. Usually they have two, two accounts. One Islamic bank and one conventional bank. And then these guys, the floating mass, it depends on the return. When the return is higher in conventional, they move their money to conventional, and when the return higher in Syria, they move. Meanwhile, more and more non-Muslims are deciding to use Islamic banking. In Malaysia, over 50% of HSBC customers who opt for a Sharia product are not Muslims. For the non-Muslims, it's only for the economic reason. So uh, if they are able to benefit from Islamic finance or Islamic banking products, for example, the transparency, the simplicity, the profitability, and most important of all, I think, 
is the ethical and the transparency of Islamic finance. Because of its ban on interest, the Islamic financial system is thought to be far more transparent. Money is invested in concrete projects or services with the result that the investor can see where his money has gone. And here in the Java countryside, Islamic finance lives on in its original form. Goats are still goats. And in the days of the Prophet Muhammad, to own 20 goats was to be rich. Enough of uh, 1,400 years ago and enough now. If you have 20 goats now, you will, you know, you don't need to worry about uh, meat, you don't need to worry about it, because they will produce things. Iqbal Muhaymin is an expert on gold and goats. He made his money as a conventional banker, but he realized that the conventional financial system does not protect the savings of ordinary people from inflation, whereas gold and goats do. He produces and sells gold coins of the traditional Arab currency, the dinar. This is the, what we call it, one dinar. One dinar is uh, a coin gold coins uh, at the weight of 4.25 grams with karat 22. A gold dinar is worth about 150 US dollars and can't fall victim to inflation. One dinar equates roughly to the price of a goat. So Iqbal offers a safe alternative to traditional cash investments. Good value actually compared to real physical thing, the real money, where it's gold, are stable. But of course, if you're buying using fiat money, paper money, then increase depend on how much uh, the rupiah or dollars uh, devalue it every year. Iqbal is not going to change the global economy like this, but it's his way of helping the poor on the basis of his faith and sharia. <laughs> Financial advisor Liang Se Hien during his weekly radio broadcast. The people of the banking hub of Singapore are thought to be level headed when it comes to investment. If it works for you and it's going to give you a more desirable outcome, then it does not matter what it's called, whether it's conventional or Islamic. Conventional bank failures have sown insecurity all around the world. Clearly there's a level of cynicism within the, uh, within the community towards banks and bankers. Uh, I think we've become the most unpopular people in the world. Advocates of Islamic finance, on the other hand, stress how much more reliable their system is. Very few Islamic financial institutions were affected by the recent crisis, uh, simply because they were are uh, not allowed to participate in some of the leverage financing. But the experts are aware of how big the cultural differences between both systems still are. Yes, I think this is, uh, people in Europe think this is very, very uh, revolutionary. Because uh, they, get, they already get used with this uh, capitalistic system. So if they hear about this, um, it is something quite uh, new for them. Something new in finance that promises growth? But it's not everyone's cup of tea. My message to the man on the street and to the regulators that forget about something called Islamic banking. Others look for some kind of compromise. At that level, you know, where, where it comes to helping people and caring for people and using our resources, we should look for ways in which we can work together. We have seen children in Malaysia, Indonesia and Singapore. They are all growing up in countries with booming economies. The Islamic banking system is on an upward trend among Muslims and non-Muslims. The transparency of investing only in observable assets, the sharing of risk and the full disclosure of costs are requirements that perhaps the West could learn from.